All right. So I'd like to welcome Bill Simpson of the Field Museum uh, to the Princeton Public Library Zoom space. This is our, as I said, our first virtual program uh, for summer reading, and I'm glad you could all attend. Um, Bill is the head of geological collections and the collections manager of fossil vertebrates for the Field Museum. So that's really cool. And he's going to be talking today about Sue, the largest and most complete Tyrannosaurus. So I will turn it over to you, Bill. All right. Ooh. You can see so Ron, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be speaking to you all. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Sue's history at Field Museum. And here's an outline of what I'll be talking about. Uh, there's, I've broken the talk into three sections. Uh, then is when we, from when we first got Sue to when we put it on display. Uh, and then there's an intervening period, and then we moved Sue. And so uh, that's the third period that I'll be talking about. So let's talk about the purchase of Sue. John McCarter, the president of the Field Museum, uh, came to my boss, John Flynn, and to myself and uh, said, boys, we're going on a road trip. He uh, had the idea of uh, perhaps bidding for Sue, the world's most complete T-Rex. Uh, but he wanted to confirm first off that it was as complete as they said it was. And so that was John Flynn's, whoops, John Flynn's job. But also uh, he wanted to make sure that we could put it on display. Uh, most of our specimens are not on display, but this one was to be a prominent display, which meant that the dinosaur had to be well enough preserved that we could actually mount it, put it on an iron armature and make it look as though it would have looked in life, at least the skeleton. And I was there to confirm that the rock that it was buried in was soft enough that we could take it off. That's a process we call preparation. And at the time I was the chief preparator. We needed to know that the rock was soft enough that we could get it off of the bones in time for the whole thing to open sometime in the summer of 2000 as a millennial event. And so the three of us went to Sotheby's, which is an auction house in New York. We went to this incredibly cool building, a warehouse that had just this eclectic mix of the coolest stuff you've ever seen, including the world's most complete T-Rex. So John Flynn was there uh, checking off what was, what was uh, present of the skeleton. Now, most of the skeleton was still in rock in what we call field jackets. Uh, the side of the skull had been exposed, uh, but John was able to de determine that in fact, Sue was as complete as they said it was. Uh, after all the dust settled and we got all the rock off the bone, this is how complete Sue turned out to be. So you can see there isn't much missing. Volume wise, Sue is about 90% complete. So uh, both my boss and I gave John McCarter a thumbs up and so then John went out to raise money. The museum, he thought, you know, the, the fossil might go for $2 million, $3 million, and the museum doesn't have that kind of cash laying around. So he put together a consortium of corporations and private individuals uh, led by McDonald's, which is a Chicago corporation, uh, and they brought Disney in along with them. And so uh, soon, uh, John McCarter had the wherewithal, the war chest, so to speak, to attend the auction in October of 1997. Um, the auction started at 500,000 and went up by increments of 100,000. Uh, we had a man literally doing our bidding for us, Richard Gray. He was uh, a fine arts dealer and well versed in how to go about uh, navigating these large dollar auctions. And he said, uh, told us, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna occupy an office overlooking the auction floor and we're gonna turn the lights off so nobody knows who's in there. And we're gonna send in our bids by phone. And so in this short video, you'll see a woman answering the phone and she's taking various bids from various bidders by the phone, including Field Museum. We only entered at the very end because we didn't wanna drive the price up. So let me play this video for you. 
And I begin with a bid of five hundred thousand dollars. I'm bidding at five hundred thousand dollars. I'm bidding at five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars, seven hundred thousand dollars. Now at seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. I'm bidding at nine hundred thousand dollars. I'm bidding at one million dollars. I'm bidding at one million. One point one on the telephone. Now one point two in the last row. One point three million. Also in the last. One point four million in the center. Five million dollars. Five point one. Five point two. Seven five. <laughs> Seven million six hundred thousand. At seven million six on the phone. Fair warning then at seven million six hundred thousand. Up here. Seven million six hundred thousand. Now at this point, nobody knows who that winning bidder was uh, because we'd been bidding from a darkened room. And so now Richard Gray stepped up to the podium to announce who the winning bidder was. This morning, I have the pleasure of having been awarded custody of Sue, the world's largest and probably oldest young lady. She will spend her next birthday, her 70 millionth, in her new home on the shores of Lake Michigan. That is, of course, in Chicago at the renowned Field Museum of Natural History. I love that moment when everyone finds out where it go, where it went to, and there's this the whole room erupts in applause. I still get uh, tingles just hearing that. All right, so we now had a new dinosaur. We had to take the rock off of it, and I was in charge of that phase of it, what we call preparation. And then we also were going to study it and then mount it for display. So that's what we're going to talk about now. In November, uh, the specimen arrived at Field Museum. And this is, I think, when we all realized just how high profile this whole project was going to be. All it was was the arrival of a semi-truck and there were reporters all over the loading dock to interview us as the truck pulled in. Uh, we had an exhibit uh, case, which was our first preparation lab, the laboratory where we took the rock off the bones. But obviously an exhibit case has no ventilation. It was, it was only temporary uh, until two new preparation labs could be built, uh, both funded by McDonald's. Uh, and then I had to decide where to, which, which bones of the skeleton we would be prepared at which labs. And here you can see the bones that we kept at the Chicago lab. The other lab was down at Disney World, uh, which consists of four subunits, and they were just opening the fourth subunit called Animal Kingdom. And there was a sub subunit of Animal Kingdom called Dino Land, which McDonald's funded. And so that's where the second lab was built. So when you see here in Orlando, that's what that refers to. The first of the two new preparation labs to open up was in fact the one down in Orlando and uh, Disney World. That opened up in April and we sent the back half of Sioux to be prepared down there. And then the McDonald's Fossil Preparation Lab actually in the Field Museum opened up in June of 1998 and that uh, is still one of our three research prep labs so it's still in operation. The one in Orlando got torn down as soon as Sue was finished. We hired a young man named Chris Brochu to be the person to study Sue. What we wanted was for him to publish what's called a monograph. This is a scientific study on one single subject. And in this case, the, the single subject was the species Tyrannosaurus rex. The mounting team uh, was actually in New Jersey. The American Museum's uh, mount shop was headed up by a man named Phil Fraley. He'd already mounted the American Museum's T-Rex as well as hundreds of other American Museum skeletons. And uh, he wanted a, sh a second shot at doing a T-Rex. So he asked for a leave of absence. The American Museum said no. And so he resigned and started his own company. Uh, he rented a space called the Johnson Atelier. An atelier is a sculpture studio, but this was a huge building. It was part of the old New Jersey State Fairgrounds and it was big enough to mount a dinosaur in. And here you can see some of the shots of Sue being mounted in New Jersey. And then also we knew that some people wouldn't be able to come to Field Museum and see Sue in person. And so um, 
my preparators made a mold of every single bone in Sue's skeleton and sent those molds to Toronto where a company called RCI made casts from the molds and they actually mounted the casts into uh, mounted skeletons. Uh, this is a picture of two of those because we wanted, and we were gonna travel these around the country and eventually they traveled around the world. These were Field Museum's first traveling exhibits. Uh, but I love this photo because it isn't often you get to see two T-Rex skeletons side by side. Uh, once the mounters were done, so, so the, the, the progress of the work went like this. My preparators would take the rock off of the bones, then the bones would be sent to the staff photographer to be photographed for the monograph, and then they'd be sent, and, well, Chris Berushu was in, in the building, Chris would then study the bones, and then they'd be sent off to the mounting crew in New Jersey. And it was the mounting crew that dictated which bones would be prepared first. And because it's a bipedal animal, uh, they wanted the hips first, followed by the hind legs, and then the vertebral column, and, and so on and so forth. So that's how it worked. We took the rock off the bones, they were photographed, studied, sent to New Jersey to be mounted, and once, and we would visit occasionally to make sure that the skeleton was being put together correctly. Uh, we had to make a couple changes along the way. And then eventually in the uh, spring of 2000, the skeleton was completely mounted in New Jersey. And the mount is executed in such a way that you can take individual bones off the mount to be studied. We knew that because this was the most complete T-Rex, that it was gonna be studied by paleontologists a lot. And so though it was going on exhibit, it is still a part of our research collection. And so this mount was made to come apart easily. And indeed, that's what they did in New Jersey. They took it all back apart, shipped all the pieces and all the bones to Chicago, and then they put it back together. It took about two weeks to put it back together in the big main hall of the Field Museum called Stanley Field Hall. And you can see there's a wooden barricade because we wanted it we wanted to unveil the skeleton, so we didn't want the visitors to see it until the opening day. Uh, there was a woman whose sole job was organizing the opening day, uh, which was May 17, 2000. And she picked that date more than a year in advance. And so we were working to a deadline, which is unusual for us. We usually don't have to do that. Um, the unveiling was a huge media event. Here you can see all the media vans assembling outside the Field Museum. Um, the, the wooden bulkhead behind which Sue is mounted has now been replaced with a double uh, curtain. Uh, they practiced the dropping of this curtain all throughout the night uh, before the unveiling just to make sure that it would go properly. Uh, Sue was unveiled live on Good Morning America and the Today Show. And I've got another video to show you from uh, some of the media coverage of that event, opening day, May 17th, 2000. From NBC News, this is Today. After 67 million years, Sue is about to make her entrance. There is a lot of excitement at Chicago's Field Museum this morning over a bunch of old bones. And these aren't just any old bones. This is 2020 Wednesday. Live on our show, we're going to unveil Sue, a 67 million year old dinosaur, the most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton ever found. Will visitors to the museum, John, be able to learn about a, a T-Rex first hand? We've made it so that people can get up eyeball to eyeball with the real skull. You can see all this stuff with your own eyes and, and know that it's real. Chicago still has Oprah and Sammy Sosa, but it's been missing a big star since Michael Jordan retired. Well, today, it got a new one, one for the ages. right now. It's just incredible. I've seen a lot of entrances, but that was a very special entrance. I like that it's like so big. 
Would she have been at the top of the food chain during her time? Yeah, there wasn't anybody that could mess with soup. I think it's magnificent. It's very cool. We leave you tonight with the biggest, most complete T-Rex skeleton ever found. A star was born today in Chicago. We set uh, records that year for museum attendance. Uh, there were lines outside the museum. We had to even open the emergency exit so that people didn't have to wait so long to get in. So it was a big deal. Uh, and then it is so it was originally supposed to go into its own exhibit hall, but that exhibit hall hadn't been built yet. So it went into the big main hall temporarily and that temporarily turned out to be 18 years. And during that 18 years, we, uh, the, one of the donors of the project was so inspired by it that he actually funded a research position, a, a dinosaur curatorial position. And so in 2001, we hired Pete Makovicki, who is one of the most high profile dinosaur scientists in the world. Uh, Pete just got lured away by the University of Minnesota last year. And so we have hired a new dinosaur paleontologist who starts in October of this year. Uh, Jing May O'Connor is a, a specialist in the evolution of birds. All birds, of course, are dinosaurs. And so we're very much looking forward to Jing May's uh, arrival in October. Uh, during this intervening period, many researchers, as we expected, came to study Sioux and find out really the details of what T Rex looked like. Uh, even the man who dug up uh, Sue, Pete Larson. It was his girlfriend, Sue Hendrickson, that found Sue, and, and Pete is the one that named it Sue after his girlfriend. Actually, they were just breaking up, so she told me this was her going away present to Pete Larson, but we've uh, let Pete have uh, complete access to Sue. This is the real skull, which is in a bulletproof case. Uh, it's on uh, miniature railroad rails, and we can open the front of the case and roll the skull out so that it can be studied uh, very closely uh, by paleontologists. Uh, another thing that we did during these intervening years uh, the, for the 10th anniversary of the opening of Sioux, uh, we scanned Sioux. Uh, and this involved three different scanning techniques and four different scanners. The first one uh, was a green light laser scanner that the Chicago Police Department CSI unit used to document crime scenes. They scan the entire mounted skeleton to give us a framework. And then the other scans were much more detailed. Individual bones were scanned, and those more detailed scans were sort of added or hung on to the, the uh, CSI scan. And in that way, we had a complete digital model of Sioux. The reason we wanted this was that we wanted to estimate the live, the mass or the live weight of Sioux, because that's an important parameter in figuring out locomotion you know, could this animal run or not? Previous methods of estimating mass had come up with an adult T-Rex weighing something like six to seven tons. Sue's the biggest T-Rex, and so we wanted to get an updated and more accurate measurement of the mass of this skeleton, and one based on the skeleton itself. Previous techniques, uh, required a sculptor to sculpt what they thought the live animal look, would look like. So with this complete 3D uh, model of the entire skeleton, we came up with a live weight of Sue at about nine tons, so much heavier than we expected. And make that, that figure makes it even less likely that this animal could run. All right, so let's get to the third phase, uh, which ran from 2018 to the present time, actually. And uh, we'll start with the dismantling. So at this point, Sue uh, was still in the big main hall, but its exhibit hall had been created. And so it now had its own home to move to. So we very carefully uh, took it apart. We hired RCI, that company that made the mounted casts, and they took Sue apart. Uh, Phil Fraley's crew had retired. They started by taking apart the feet because the feet are right in contact with the fake landform. And we had a, a exhibit registrar very carefully inventorying and photographing and taking notes on every single bone of Sue that was uh, taken apart. 
and I oversaw this operation. So now let's talk. So once the skeleton was all taken apart, it was moved up to the new exhibit hall and it was remounted. So this is what the new exhibit hall looked like, partially built. Um, everything overhead had been built so that that wouldn't get in the way of things. Um, there were some parts of the mount that were not changed. For example, the vertebral column. And so that went together fairly quickly. But having moving Sue gave us a unusual opportunity to, to update parts of the skeleton. You don't often get to remount a dinosaur skeleton. So we wanted to, you know, we had learned new things over the 20 years since Sue had first been mounted. And so we, we made a few changes to the mount. So let's talk about those. There are six main changes. By far the most obvious one is that we added the gastralia. These are the gastralia. They're sometimes referred to as belly ribs. They're not really ribs, they're embedded in the body wall musculature. Um, but they really make Sue much bigger looking. Uh, the old mount, you, you don't see anything down here, but with the gastralia, Sue has this big belly. And it's, it's a much more robust animal with the gastralia added. We always had the gastralia. We just weren't exactly sure how they went on the mount and we sort of ran out of time. So I was very happy that the second version, the remounting included the gastralia. We think gastralia probably aid in respiration. Uh, dinosaurs, reptiles don't have a diaphragm, which is the muscle that mammals use to inflate and deflate the chest, bringing air in and out of the lungs. But reptiles don't have a diaphragm. Um, you can see here in this gavial skeleton, you've got the vertebrae and then the ribs, and then underneath are the gastralia. And in fact, a turtle's, the bottom of a turtle shell, the plastron, we think is made from fused gastralia. Another couple changes were sort of related to one another. In the first mount, the right knee sort of poked into the rib cage. When you're mounting real fossils, the, the bones are distorted a little bit. And those distortions resulted in this problem of the right knee being too close to the rib cage. So what we did was we unflexed the right leg a bit because we thought it was crouching a little bit too much. And we also swept the ribs back a little bit so that the, the chest wasn't as barrel chested as it was in the original mount. And these two things uh, put some separation between the right knee and the rib cage. Uh, the wishbone was uh, exchanged. So when you all have Thanksgiving dinner and you're eating a turkey, that wishbone that you take out of the turkey and make a wish on, that's a dinosaur, a theropod, a meat-eating dinosaur characteristic. And all birds are meat-eating dinosaurs, although they're not all meat-eating, but they come from the, the theropod side of dinosaurs. They basically, the, the clavicle or the fer furcula are uh, the two fused clavicles, but we refer to it colloquially as the wishbone. Uh, we had taken a guess at what the wishbone or what the wishbone looked like in the first mount, but that was just an ed educated guess and it was wrong. We actually had the furcula all along. The furcula should look like the symmetric boomerang shaped bone. But like so many bones in Sue, Sue is not only the most complete and, and the largest, she's also the oldest T-Rex known. And it has all kinds of injuries, including to the furcula. And the furcula was so asymmetric that we didn't recognize it as a furcula uh, when we first mounted Sue. So by adding the actual furcula, you can see the shoulder blades articulate with it and the arms come out of the shoulder blades. So it, it completely changed the, the location of the arms by adding the real furcula. And then finally, we increase the gape. We open the mouth a little bit lar uh, wider because, you know, why not? All right, now while we had the skeleton taken apart, we, that gave us the opportunity to do a little science. Um, we'd always been interested in how old Sue was when it died. Um, Pete Makovicki's previous work had indicated that Sue was about 28 years old when it died. It turns out that dinosaurs, like trees, get 
growth rings. Uh, they stop growing one season every year. And when they start up growing again, it leaves a line. Now in trees, we call them tree rings. In dinosaurs, we call them lags, L-A-G. It stands for lines of arrested growth. And you can basically just count the lines. And so having Sue taken apart, we, we had done this to a rib. We had sectioned a rib and sampled that. But having Sue taken apart gave us the chance to sample two more bones. We sampled the thigh bone, the femur, and the fibula, which is a bone next to the shin bone embedded in the, thigh, in the uh, calf muscles. We uh, made a core through the femur with a diamond-tipped uh, bit, and the fibula we cut with a wafering saw. Here's the, the diamond tip attached to a drill press, and that's one of the high bones. It's kind of wet with water, but it's stuff that heat up because then the diamond is off the bit. So we made that core, we cut the core in half, we glued half to a glass slide, then we ground it down until it was so thin on the glass slide that you could pass light through it and then we could put it under a microscope and count the rings. And the result is that Sue was likely older than we thought it was. Um, older than 30, maybe as old as 33 years old when it died. Now let's talk about the new Sue Hall. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's very elegant. Uh, this puts Sue in its Cretaceous context, its Cretaceous world. Sue lived about 67 million years ago. And we always had wanted to show the other animals and plants that lived with Sue. In addition, there are six glass screens here that onto which we projected and uh, we do project three different animations trying to show what L Sue's life was like in the Cretaceous. And I'm going to play one of those animations for you. This was called Flash and um, I'm going to because I don't want to run over on our time too much here. I'm going to work a little bit. It starts with such a triceratops. Whose world think by you? Think of the new world by you. Very hot, very wet, not very smooth. Notice the Triceratops got Sue's left leg and now Sue is limping. This is based on the fact that Sue's left fibula, which is, as I say, this bone next to the shin bone uh, embedded in the calf muscle, is hugely pathologic. The right one looks normal. The left one, Sue suffered some sort of massive injury and the bone got infected. So this is our guess at uh, what caused that injury. Another part of the uh, Sioux Hall is what we refer to as the Wall of Fame, which shows a lot of the bits and pieces of fossils from other animals. Uh, and then we have a mural above it showing what a scene might have looked like, including all of these animals and plants that Sue lived with. Uh, there's also uh, a few sensory stations. You can uh, smell what a carnivore's breath is like. It's not very pleasant. Think rotten meat. Uh, you can hear what Su Sue's roar may have sounded like and felt like. You can put your elbows on this uh, station and you not only hear it, but you feel it through your whole body. Uh, we've got some bronze casts of actual T-Rex skin impressions, so you can see what uh, Sue's uh, skin might have felt like. And then we also have some smell stations from various plants that, that lived at the time of Sue. And I'll end with a picture of the people that, that made this exhibit, the wonderful museum crew. Uh, this exhibit is, 
as you can well imagine, probably the most popular uh, at the museum. And we are looking forward to uh, our visitors returning. The museum reopened today to its members and next Friday will reopen to the public. And with that, I will end, uh, give the screen back and I'll be glad to take any questions that anyone has. Thanks, Bill. That was really, really cool. Uh, let me go ahead. I think you'll have to I'll ask you guys to unmute. Uh, Thank you. Sure. How many different animals did you find besides Triceratops and Ankylosaurus or whatever it was called? Um, probably something like 20. I've not, never actually counted, but the two big prey items for T-Rex, we think, were Triceratops and Edmontosaurus. Uh, which is a big duckbill dinosaur, uh, but there are also pachycephalosaurs, these dome-headed animals, uh, and and some other smaller carnivorous dinosaurs. So there there were a lot of other creatures alive at the time. There's a beautiful turtle skull about this big that was found at the Sioux site. So you know, just just like today, there are lots of animals. Sioux is just the apex predator. Right. I also thought I saw a crab skeleton, right? Did you find, or was it another bone? Kind of looked like a crab bone skeleton. Um, I don't think that. What you may have seen, we have a piece of jawbone from an ornithomimid, and these are toothless uh, animals, uh, but that doesn't mean they can't be carnivores. Think about an eagle. They don't have any teeth, but they're still pretty dangerous. That may have been what you saw that looked like a crab. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Talk? Okay, so the first thing first is I met Peace Dawson and I will remember you and we're gonna come back on Monday. So he's saying that he, he met Pete Larson at the uh, Black Hills Institute a couple oh, years ago, did. and we also took a tour with you a couple years ago. Wow! And uh, we're gonna come back to the museum on Monday. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, we're really looking forward to our visitors coming back. Cool. Did you have another question? Did you have another uh, question? It's actually, I love fossils and um museums so much. I'm in my own lab and I collect fossils. Oh, look, there's a beautiful ammonite. Now, right this was only $10. Oh, okay. Very cool. And then I have $10. Oh, yes. And this beautiful Mosasaurus one. So, you know, dinosaur, the word dinosaur means terrible lizard because yeah. Greek and Latin, the kind of reptiles that were the most common were actual lizards, but dinosaurs are not lizards. They're another kind of reptile, but a mosasaur actually is a lizard. It's a lizard that went to sea and became a, an aquatic animal. It's related to how it's kind of like a swimming crocodile. You know, it is, it's even, Crocodiles are a member of the group that dinosaurs belong to, called the archosaurs, the ruling reptiles, and lizards are not an archosaur. So mm. even closer, do you know what a Komodo dragon is? Yes. So, yeah. so That's Mosasaur the biggest lizard on the planet. Like Komodo <laughs> dragons that have gone to sea. Wow. Um, I've heard they are getting pretty rare. There's like less than 200, or was it 1,000? <laughs> There are, yeah, Komodos, yeah, there are lots of different species of monitor lizards, that's the family name. Um, Komodo dragons are simply the biggest monitor lizard, but uh, yeah, they, they're endangered. Yeah. I also have another question. Yeah. I've heard at the, what was it called? It was called a canyon or something, like a, a monument of Grand Canyon? Yeah, the Grand Canyon. Can you mine out some of the fossils out of the limestone? I've been wondering that. A ask it one more time. I didn't quite hear it. So are you asking, do we have well, fossils from the Grand Canyon? Or can you um, excavate more? 
is what he's asking. Grand Canyon, because it would be fun to mine out one or two. The Grand Canyon is a national park. So the way it works is that if you're a paleontologist, then you apply for a permit. And in this case, you'd have to get a collecting permit from the National Park Service. And then, yes, you could collect fossils from the Grand Canyon. Oh, oh. Uh, Sue was found on private land, right? Yes, Sue was found on a land belonging to a Native American, and there was a, a huge struggle over ownership. And uh, it went to court, and the judge eventually awarded Sue to the landowner, not N Pete Larson's company that, that dug it up. Mm and then the landowner put it up for auction at Sotheby's, and that's when Field Museum came into the picture. But I so, went to school in Rapid City. I knew Pete Larson. In fact, his younger brother, Neil, was the first person I met when I got to campus in uh, 1976. So uh, it was sort of, uh, I was surprised. I mean, we'd all known about Sue. It was collected in August of 1990, and wasn't put up for auction until 1997. So for seven years, all of us academic paleontologists wondered what in the world was gonna to happen to this because, you know, Pete Larson, he's a commercial fossil dealer. He, he, if he had had possession of it, he would have, might have sold it. Um, but since it went back to the landowner, it was, we thought it would be sold and who, who would buy it, you know, we all had, worries that maybe Bill Gates would put it in his living room or something, right? But uh, we were very happy when it came to a public institution like Field That's Museum. Exciting. Because not only can the public see it, but okay. scientists from all over the world can study it. So it's available to everyone. That is great. Yeah, I have a few of my own fossils, but I don't, I can't find them. What <laughs> was a skeleton of a chick or something I found in my rock garden. Oh yeah. Another sand dollar I found at New Jersey, a sand dollar shell, in fact. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. They are. And the last one was a snail shell I also found at my house. It was hidden with the rocks. Ah. It was not exactly a shell, but it was more like a rock that had the shape of a snail shell in it. Well, keeping track of your fossils, that's what I do at the Field Museum. So I'm very much a librarian like Ron is. It's just that what I keep track of are not books, they're vertebrate fossils. Um, and as I said, very little of what we have goes on display. Less than one half of 1% of our research collection ever makes it onto exhibit. And so my job as a collection manager is to make sure we take good care of all the fossils that we have, both the things on exhibit and the things in, in the collection. Uh, we have a big lending program like Ron's library does. We have thousands of vertebrate fossils on loan to hundreds of vertebrate paleontologists all over the world. Some of the fossils are too big to be loaned out or too small and fragile or just too numerous. And so uh, scientists will write to me and ask to uh, be admitted into our behind the scenes research collection rooms so that they can study fossils that are not on exhibit. And I'm the person they have to go through for that. So a collection manager is very much a, a librarian. May I ask, is, is the facility where you keep all that, is that right there at the Field Museum or is there another location? Yeah, I have five what we might call libraries. We happen to call them collection ranges, but all the, the field museum is still under one roof. It's a, uh, it's a big roof. Uh, the, 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 the floor, uh, the square footage is 1.2 million square feet. So it's a big building. It extends two stories underground and my five libraries, my five collection ranges, there's the fossil fish range, uh, the fossil mammal range, the fossil herp range. Herp is a shorthand for reptiles and amphibians. And then with fossils, there's a whole bunch of things that don't fall into either one of those. Um, and then there's the oversized collection room, which is organized around the use of a forklift. So that's where the big <laughs> diamonds are. And then we have a fifth one called the garage, which is a sort of a lag deposit of mounted skeletons 
that are in the old fossil vertebrate hall that, and were not reused when we moved to the new fossil vertebrate hall, which is now called Evolving Planet. So that's where we keep our, we have about 100,000 cataloged vertebrate fossils, which is a fairly small, in terms of numbers, a small collection for Field Museum. The biggest collection is the insect collection, which we don't even know how big it is. We think it's something like 13 million, but they're not a, just a tiny sliver or catalog. That's amazing. Well, when we went to the Museum of Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, oh, they yeah. a whole building across the street of all their historical library, and that's for further study, and I'm yeah. sure they have so many things there that are not in display at the sure. museum. Yeah, that's the way it often is. Yeah. If it's, if it's a research museum, then right. you're going to have a lot of things that aren't on display. That's, that's, and, and we go out every year collecting more fossils and adding oh, to the collection. Oh, that's wonderful. I've heard that mosquitoes can be sometimes are found in like yellow dew or what's it called? Honey? Amber. Amber. Yeah, yeah Amber. Yeah, Amber. Yeah, that was the story behind uh, Jurassic Park, yeah. wasn't it? That there was dinosaur blood in those mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, I have a book that shows a picture of a bunch of mosquitoes stuck in it. So I read about it. They've that. even found dinosaurs in amber, very small, juvenile little bits, like a, a, a hind leg or a tail of a <laughs> small dinosaur, and they're feathered. Maybe oh, they're wow. enough or something. We used like to that. think feathers were only in birds, but now we know that birds are dinosaurs and that it isn't just bird dinosaurs that have feathers, non bird dinosaurs also have feathers. We have a question from our friend in green. Yeah. Well, um, I have a question. It's kind of like Jurassic Park. Do you think we could? Do you think we could do what they did in Jurassic Park? Well, as a scientist, I've learned never to say never. But <laughs> at this time, I don't see how. DNA, the molecule that, that contains all the information on how to build a person or a dinosaur or a mosquito, DNA doesn't last 67 million years. Um, we found frozen mammoths. When I say we, the world knows that there are frozen mammoths in Siberia. In fact, I got to handle Liuba, which is a complete baby mammoth that came out of the permafrost. It was about a month old, uh, still had its mother's milk in its stomach. But even Liuba's DNA isn't good enough to create a clone. You may have heard that there, for example, a sheep, Dolly the sheep got cloned. I but just read about that. That took a living cell and all we have from even a mammoth, even as well preserved as it is, all those cells are dead. We have not figured out how to resurrect dead DNA. Maybe right. mosquitoes. Mm. <laughs> As I say, you never say never, but at this point, it seems pretty unlikely. Hey, maybe, Bill, I've... In the... <laughs> maybe if the mosquitoes had any blood that they still left drinking, you could fit, and maybe they had a living cell of blood. Yeah, amber is millions of years old is the problem, so probably not still alive. <laughs> so. I know you mentioned that the, you actually had a, an impression of T-Rex skin. Mm -hmm. um, were T-Rexes one of the feathered dinosaurs? Do we know about that? Did they have? That's a, that's a great question, Ron. There are two traveling T-Rex exhibits right now. One is built and is traveling, uh, built by the American Museum in New York. And they have a, they've created a full-sized fleshed out example of what they think T-Rex looked like. And in theirs, they've got some feathers up on the head and in a few other spots. It's mostly bare, but has some feathers as a sort of ornamentation. We decided, Field Museum is also putting together, we're just finishing up, it's gonna leave in August, uh, another traveling T-Rex exhibit. And we've also created a full-size life restoration. And in ours, we have not put feathers on it. Um, the skin impressions don't show, they show ossicles on the surface in the skin. So there's no evidence of feathers in the skin impressions that we have. Also, feathers didn't originate to help dinosaurs fly. Um, 
we think dinosaurs were warm blooded like we are. They create their own heat. And just like you would never dream of heating your house without insulating it, an animal that creates its own heat is going to want to keep that heat. Mammals use hair, dinosaurs use feathers. But once you get to the size of an adult T Rex, you probably have more of a problem getting rid of heat than retaining it. It's a surface to volume thing. Once you get as big as a, an adult T Rex, you've got a lot more volume compared to how much surface, which is where the heat escapes through the surface. Mm -hmm. So we think that maybe as a juvenile, baby T Rexes may have been feathered, but when they grew up, they didn't need feathers anymore. Now this is how science works. So we have two competing hypotheses. The American Museum says maybe they could be a little bit feathered. Field Museum doesn't think so. We will see, maybe in 10 years, we'll have the answer to that question. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, my dad watched with me um, on news about um, a place and then they were like pulling off rocks to his melting a bit where he chews. And then they asked those like company if they could, and they think the only way to really get the pollen frost back is to bring back the mammoths and the mastodons. And they said, maybe we'll have them in five years. Mm. Mm. There is a, uh, there's a whole science, uh, the de-extinction science. And there's a, uh, a, a woman who is one of the prominent scientists in this field. And she's written a book on cloning a mammoth. There's also uh, a YouTube of her giving a lecture on that. Um, and I'm sort of uh, treading water here trying to remember her name and it's, it's not coming up. But if you, if you go on YouTube and look up how to clone a mammoth, you'll find it. And she explains why it seems terribly unlikely that that will succeed. Mm -hmm. What's most likely to work is to alter an Indian elephant. An Asian elephant is a very close relative of the mammoths. The African elephants are much more primitive, so they're not very close relatives. But the Asian elephant is a close relative of the extinct mammoth. And so there's another group that is trying to alter the genome of an Asian elephant to make it cold adapted make it you know have the various characteristics that a mammoth had and that's probably the most likely way we're going to come up with something that looks kind of like and, and maybe behave something like a mammoth oh. and if if we can get a animal like this that's cold adapted elephants have a better chance of surviving right now of course they live in very warm areas where there's a lot of pressure from humans to hunt them. But if we can get them cold adapted and, and get them up in Siberia where very few people live, the species might even last longer. There's actually a place called Pleistocene Park in Siberia, started by a father-son team of PhD yeah, scientists. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the people they were interviewing. They just took like a giant jeep and just Cloud trees. It was well, yeah, their, so th their idea is that the mammoth tundra, which is the environment the mammoths lived in and doesn't exist on Earth anymore, that the mammoth tundra was created by trampling. You have all these trees trying to grow up, but they get trampled by all the animals, the big things like the mammoths and a lot of other hoofed Max, animals. Yeah. So they're bringing in all these hoofed animals that have not gone extinct to help with the trampling and produce a mammoth tundra. Now, they don't have a mammoth yet to, to bring into Pleistocene Park, but that's the idea. And, and another cute wrinkle to all this is that if it works, the permafrost won't melt as quickly. Right now, the permafrost, well, the Arctic got up to 100 degrees this summer. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, the tundra, if, if the mammoth uh, environment can be recreated, the permafrost 
will last long. You'll have a thicker snow cover and um, the permafrost is full of carbon. So when the permafrost melts, you get huge amounts of, of uh, greenhouse gases released. And so this is the hook that they use to try and sell their idea that it's good for the world's uh, environment to keep the permafrost frozen. So Bill, uh, I think I saw in your bio that, that you, know, you kind of were inspired to get into science by going to the Field Museum when you were younger. Yes. Um, and that you also did, you went, got into your field through zoology and then kind of moved into the paleontology and, and geology. But kind of, can you talk a little bit just about you know, how kids today might go into your field and kind of maybe what brought you, I mean, did you always want to be a paleontologist or did you kind of, find that as you went along your way. I'm gonna answer this quickly, Ron, because at two o'clock I have a staff meeting to ah, attend. Cool, okay. <laughs> so paleontology is a, a, a interdisciplinary science. So every paleontologist has training in biology of some sort. In my case, it was zoology. Paleobotanists would have botany training and geology on the other hand. Um, and my story is really very common amongst vertebrate paleontologists, which is that I started getting interested in it at the age of six or seven and just sort of never grew up. So a lot of vertebrate paleontologists are, are just dinosaur nerds who never grew up. And that's, <laughs> that's the way it worked for me. My, my mother took me to Field Museum when I was little, bought me some plastic dinosaurs, a few dinosaur books, and, and I never looked back. Okay. Okay. And so with that, I think I'm going to have to sign off, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, Bill. This was a lot of Thank fun. You. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for attending.